can everybody hear me? Rocky, can you hear me at the back? Good. Okay. So I don't need to shout, which is, uh, which is uh, good. So um, without further ado, I'll kick things off. So um, just to briefly introduce myself, uh, my name is Lawrence Then, and I'm the Managing Director of CBRE Cambodia. Uh, I would uh, like to uh, introduce uh, the panelists and say thank you very much for being involved in this session uh, this uh, evening. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Te Vong Chai, who is uh, sat, as we speak, at the front here. He's the Managing Director of Parbury Investments. We have Mr. T. Chia, who is the Head of Sales for Urban Living Solutions. And we have Mr. Hun Chan San, the Principal of ReEdge uh, Architects, an esteemed panel who I hope will answer some of your extremely exciting and engaging uh, questions. I have no doubt you are, you are holding onto your seats uh, with excitement. So uh, without further ado, I will, I will kick things off. So um, as many of you know, uh, when you're coming to our quarterly market updates, I, I really like the office uh, segment. And that's primarily because we've got so much data on it. It's one of those areas of the market that excites me and interests me. And as you'll see in this presentation, has developed extremely rapidly over the past decade, which uh, has created a lot of opportunities and, and without doubt some challenges for uh, developers. So speaking of which, um, uh, we work, uh, aka uh, we crashed. Uh, so. Uh, I think it's important to highlight that you know Cambodia is not necessarily unique in many respects. It has uh, ups, it has downs, and without doubt there are cycles that take place in the marketplace. And uh, I think, uh, as as many developers know, if you sort of overextend and and go a bit mad with your development scheme, if you go a bit crazy, then inevitably uh, you're going to have some some challenges. And I think right now, uh, many of the people in the audience that are relating to real estate inevitably will be having some challenges. But as you will see as we go through the presentation, that's life. That, that, that's real estate. And um, it's so important to think mid to long term when we are dealing with this asset class. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And uh, as we walk through this presentation, you will see that Cambodia is in a, in a wonderful place in many respects. We have this incredible um, uh, demographic dividend. Uh, we have a very young and vibrant uh, population, which you can see is uh, rapidly growing. And you can see uh, from these numbers that inevitably um, Phnom Penh is going to grow uh, over the, the short term and to the midterm, of, of course. And uh, that is going to create a lot of opportunities for those that work in uh, the real estate sector. Inevitably, with uh, development also comes uh, wealth. And uh, Cambodia is forecast to become a, a, a mid, uh, a upper mid uh, income country by 2030. So um, again, great, uh, really positive stuff. Uh, and it holds a great deal of, of potential. So. As I, as I said, as I started, inevitably we've got some challenges and uh, that is just the nature of the beast that we face. And give me a market around the world that isn't having challenges, particularly around commercial property. Uh, but these sorts of, uh, these sorts of demographics are, are really positive. When we talk about the future of work, when we talk about uh, the office of the 21st century, uh, we would be uh, very uh, poorly uh, positioned if we didn't think about uh, the, the demographics of, of this country. We're looking at an extremely young uh, uh, workforce. Um, can somebody ask the, the bar staff to, to keep the noise down because I can hear the, the whispers and conversations you're having over there. So can you keep the noise down please? Unless you want to come on the stage and, 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 and talk as well. Uh, well, you're, well. You're more than welcome. Um, so. Um, Cambodia is uh, very unusual in the fact that the average age of the country is, is 27. You know, I, I don't think there are many countries on the planet that have uh, that type of, of, of youth. So again, you know, if, you, if you look at some of our, 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 let's say, our cousins in the region, uh, they have hugely benefited from, from this demographic uh, dividend. Uh, as, as I write at the, stop, at the top of this slide here, demography is, is destiny and inevitably uh, the youth and, and the, the style of, of behavior, the culture is, is extremely important. 
and uh, will definitely help and definitely define the way in which uh, the future of work unfolds here in Cambodia. And I'm sure if any of your employers, uh, you, will, you will see uh, these behaviors that you hear about globally, you read about in the news, but are just as relevant here in Cambodia. So it's extremely important from a developer's perspective, from an employer's perspective, to understand what those drivers are, what those behaviors are, and, and feed those into uh, the workplace of uh, tomorrow. As mentioned earlier, equally exciting and interesting is the urbanization um, Cambodia is rapidly urbanizing and from a real estate perspective that's probably the, the best possible thing you could possibly have if you're an investor. If you're buying land, if you're developing retail malls, if you're developing office, um, re the reality is urbanization is your best friend. So you know, hold on tight because inevitably Phnom Penh is going to grow and is going to continue to evolve, which is actually uh, probably one of the most exciting things to see unfold here in Cambodia. I was chatting with uh, T uh, from ULS before the event, saying um, I, I, almost a, a, in an amazed way that the best banking experience I've ever had in my life has been in Cambodia. Um, I'm not going to name the bank because I'm sure everybody is fully aware of which bank I'm talking about. But the reality is that, that Cambodia is an incredibly tech savvy place. And, uh, you know, t to this day, I, I, I'm amazed by the, the digi digital economy. I'm amazed by fintech. I'm amazed by the convenience of, of, of the QR codes. I can literally pay for something anywhere. Uh, whether I'm um, with a tuk-tuk driver, or whether I'm at Rosewood, I can pay for something uh, with a QR code. And uh, that's pretty goddamn special. And uh, again, those, those tech trends that we're seeing unfolding everywhere else are just as relevant here. So it, it's likely that we will continue to see uh, this tech-friendly environment unfolding and becoming increasingly important, if not more important here in Cambodia than even in somewhere like London where the, the banking experience is pretty crappy, uh, in my uh, honest uh, opinion. So again, these tech trends that we see in uh, China, in, in Europe, in America, they're so important. And the reality is that those are going to be uh, just as important here in Cambodia. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, yeah, the, the, the real estate sector has uh, developed, uh, I think everyone can probably hear me better now, so I hope, anyway. Uh, so, uh, a as I mentioned earlier, Cambodia's skyline has just uh, ex exploded in many respects uh, over the past uh, decade or so. We didn't really have a commercial scene in 2010, and you can see even just from 2019 until today, we've gone from 500,000 square meters of office space to a million square meters of office space. And the reality is that we're going to see a, a process of, of natural selection. Uh, it's going to be very Darwinian, where the, the, the projects which are not quality, are not uh, user-friendly, are not uh, aggressive and adaptive to this changing trend, uh, will inevitably get left behind. But again, this is nothing unusual. This is part of, uh, of the real estate cycle and uh, is an exciting part of, of doing business here in Cambodia. Um, like everywhere in the world, location is uh, probably the most important component of uh, a project. Um, you know, the classic adage, location, 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 is just as important here in Cambodia, particularly around the office market. And you can see the average occupancy in BKK is, is, is the highest. It's 81%. Um, inevitably, we can see uh, Dom Pen and uh, Chak Maron are closely following. And inevitably, you know, it's that location which is absolutely critical when it comes to attracting uh, the right tenant and the right occupier into uh, the office of the 21st century. Um, just for everybody's information and just to sort of allow everybody to better understand uh, the office market here in Cambodia, we, we see around, let's say, three office formats. So the first is a centrally owned office, which is uh, like Vatanak Tower, where we've got a single landlord uh, who owns and manages everything. The second type is strata title office. Uh, this is where uh, a project is broken up almost like a condominium and uh, individuals can acquire units 
Um, it's extremely important that when you're uh, buying one of these units that you know who the developer is. The track record is key, particularly around the Strata projects. Management is also really, really important. So making sure when you're, when you're picking an investment uh, for, your, for your office, um, it's key that you understand who the developer is and understand that they, are, they are, have the vision. So I, I have a, at least one client in the audience that, was just ab that is just about to launch an office tower and he is goddamn committed to doing it. And I've said to him, okay, if you're going to do it, do it properly. Plan for the future. Plan for the trends that we're going to see in the next five to ten years, not for the office uh, of, the, of the 20th century. So uh, future proofing is key and is absolutely critical if you're going to uh, enter uh, this uh, space. The next is the serviced office and shared office. Uh, we're in one right now, actually, just for everyone's reference. So um, this is an example of, of a shared office, uh, and this is the third type of office that we see in the market here. So um, I've alluded to many of the, of the trends. I've alluded to many of the important things, uh, but I think anecdotes are extremely important. So uh, today I had a meeting with a, with a law firm uh, and uh, I you know, went over to their office, they're looking at new space, and um, it was like something you would see in Edwardian uh, England. It, it has sort of multiple offices broken up. Uh, maybe that's lawyers, I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, they had sort of, a, let's say, 50 separate offices uh, within, uh, this, uh, within this office, and that is definitely not the office of the 21st century. And that uh, client of ours wants to leave. They want to get the hell out of that office space. They understand that, that, their, that their team are not happy. They understand that the office of the 21st century, which you can see very nicely illustrated to the right, that is a, that is a retention tool. It's, a, it's, a, it's an HR tool just as much as anything. Uh, when you've got an office of the 21st century, uh, it allows you to attract talent. It allows your workforce to, to behave and work in, in a much more thoughtful manner and is very much built around uh, these uh, key themes of space, health, environmentally friendly, green. And these all sound like rubbish uh, birdswords, I'm not gonna lie, uh, I'm, I'm a skeptic. Uh, but at the same time, you know, they are really important. And the reality is that as we, as we enter uh, the sort of the next phase of the 21st century, the trends that we read about in the Financial Times or The Economist are once again just as relevant here in the Phnom Penh office space. And that's both from the landlord's perspective, but also from the occupier's perspective. And when we are talking with our, with our clients, um, particularly from international, multinational uh, companies, they are saying that we, we have to have these things built into our office space. They're asking for lead certification. They're asking for... Um, open, uh, friendly sort of uh, working environments to uh, collaboration, to uh, engagement. Uh, of course, there needs to be some private space uh, for focused work, but uh, the reality is that these, these trends uh, are important. And if we look around the region, we can see that there is a green premium, uh, aka developers can actually make more money from having their green certification, from having quality space. So. Um, once again, it's, it's highly likely that we're going to see these things unfold here in Cambodia. Um, uh, this is a, a survey that we do uh, throughout Asia Pacific. So, um, unfortunately, Cambodia, as far as I'm aware, wasn't actually included. Uh, we're going to have to chase the uh, office, uh, the, the, gl uh, the global uh, workspace solutions team and, and say, hey, you know, uh, please include us in the survey next time. But I think none of this would be particularly surprising. But uh, again, Point number one is interesting and is extremely relevant to Cambodia. So over lunch, uh, just yesterday, I was chatting with a lawyer and we were talking about the fact that parking is, is probably all the more important here in Cambodia because we don't necessarily have the public transport. So if you're in Paris or London, you can jump on the tube and get to the office. You're not necessarily going to drive in. So that's one of the, the quirks and interesting points of, of Cambodia, and it's something that is, is reflective. So it's interesting to see that even Asia Pacific says that, that the car parking is, is an extremely high uh, priority on their list. Office-based uh, hybrid working. Again, you know, this is not necessarily something that we're seeing unfolding here in Cambodia to such a great extent. Um, 
this is not dissimilar to somewhere like South Korea. South Korea is actually one of the highest performing office markets in, in Asia at the moment. And that's a reflection of their culture just as much as anything. I mean, the, uh, likely they've got extremely strong planning regulations, but um, the, the, the strong hierarchical culture that we see in Asia doesn't necessarily lend itself to uh, hybrid working in the same way. So again, culture is, is important to factor into the office of the 21st century, though it's likely that we'll see these trends uh, slowly unfold here in Cambodia just because inevitably those, those Gen Zs and those Gen Ys are going to uh, want uh, to have a, a flexible lifestyle and working environment. Um, we wouldn't necessarily be talking about the office of the 21st century if we didn't dive into some of these green certifications. Um, LEED is probably one of the most famous uh, in the world. Uh, this is an American certification but for me in particular well is interesting because it particularly focuses on things like uh, lifestyle and well-being of the users of the building um, it's a different it's a slightly different way of, uh, of approaching it and the reality is that uh, it's more holistic and uh, I think that is re reflective of the the modern culture that we we look at um, equally uh, we have some regional examples and um, I think it's likely that we're going to see some of those unfold here in Cambodia and I think for sure I know working with uh, Eurocham the green building certifications are, are being uh, developed here domestically and uh, once again uh, it's an inevitable trend so um, watch uh, this space. Um, before we dive into the panel discussion I just thought it was worthwhile giving people a few uh, case studies, a few examples of what we perceive as offices of, of the 21st century. Um, this may surprise people because of course this building was completed almost 10 years ago, but the reality is it, it holds a lot of these modern, um, uh, modern trends that, that, that we see as being important to uh, the offices of the 21st century. It has uh, ESG uh, lead certification. Um, it, it, it's mixed use, it has co-working options. Uh, it's also beautiful, and uh, I think design is 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 just as important as anything else when we when we look at a, a quality project. Um, of course, we've got uh, ULS I in the crowd today, as well as Vatnac. Not going to lie, uh, <laughs> we've also got Vatnac in the in the crowd, uh, of course. And you know, this is uh, an example of um, a, a, a mixed use development that is is planning uh, for future trends. Um, and as I, as I said to the client that is in the audience today, future-proofing your building is so important. So um, this building is mixed use. It is, it is um, energy efficient. It has a lot of the things that uh, a modern office should have in terms of retail, office, lifestyle. And inevitably, it will have a gym. It will have fitness. It will have showers, all that sort of stuff that is, is so important to the lifestyle component of what it is to be a modern office of the 21st century. This is probably a, a world-leading example just in our, in our neighborhood. Uh, one Bangkok is ticking all of the boxes and is probably uh, one of the most uh, expensive real estate developments in, in Southeast Asia uh, to this day. And it's actually really quite cool uh, to see such an advanced uh, development happen um, on our doorstep. So uh, I think that's something to emulate and something to, to study very closely if you are a developer uh, because this holds a lot of, of the key trends that we see as extremely important in terms of that very holistic way in which we look at the, the future of work which is technology focused, which is lifestyle focused, which is making sure it's aware of important trends. Um, this is the last case study and this is uh, the century. Um, this is in Ho Chi Minh City and um, why I think this one's uh, interesting, why th I think this one's important is because it is so uh, community focused. Um, community is built into the DNA of, of this company and uh, I think it, it holds a lot of really interesting case studies for, uh, for any developer, particularly from a lifestyle perspective, particularly from a community perspective. That's not an easy thing to do by any means. Creating a community is probably one of the hardest uh, things to, to, to crack, but again, it just highlights some of the most important uh, trends around uh, the future of work. 
So um, I've, I think I've got a few moments left before we jump into the panel discussion. Um, key trends to think about when we think about the, the, the future of work. ESG is an inevitability um, within reason. So um, when I chat with uh, friends and clients about, um, about offices in, in Cambodia, they all have backup generators and I think the indication is that the grid is not quite where it should be in terms of uh, supply stability the benefit we have from more energy efficient buildings is that actually socially um, it's a much more thoughtful uh, position if that makes sense because it puts a lower uh, pressure on the lid on the lid on the on the grid <laughs> so um but equally uh, we have to think about other areas such as, you know, China inevitably is, is an important part of uh, the real estate market, whether it's from a developer perspective or from, um, an, you know, from an investment perspective. So uh, the reality is that, um, you know, China is going to continue to be an important part of, of Cambodia's uh, development and uh, it's something that we have to factor into the future of work and the way in which uh, we uh, operate and the way in which we grow as an economy. Technology, I've, I've touched on uh, already, and I think, um, you know, just just incredible seeing how quickly things like uh, ChatGBT and other uh, AI technology has uh, developed. Um, this sort of fringes on the ESG side of things just as much as anything, but I think the key here is that work in Cambodia will inevitably uh, adopt all of these crazy AI trends. They already are for sure because, you know, we, we, sh we certainly use it in our office. And I know uh, many people uh, in the audience today are also using these tools, and you know it, it, it's inevitable. It's interesting and it's exciting. Um, this uh, is more focused on the industrial side of things. So, I think as Cambodia further diversifies and, and develops its industrial base, this too will complement and and help uh, the office sector develop and grow. So, you know. This is just as important for uh, the development of the overall economy, but also for the overall maturing and development of the office market. Service industry, again, is, is an inevitability as Cambodia develops uh, as it grows. Uh, that young, well-educated population already here, but also continuing to get better education, gives pretty strong indications that this is going to be an important sector. Um, I was in Taiwan recently and uh, I was shocked by uh, the lack of English proficiency. I had, it was the first time I've had culture shock for a while. But the thing that it, the, the thing that it sort of uh, told me was uh, maybe business process outsourcing could be a thing in Cambodia. Because the reality is um, so many people speak English to such a high degree uh, domestically, whether it's a tuk-tuk driver or again, whether it's in, in Rosewood. So I, I, I was skeptical, actually, in many respects for a while that this would that take place. But actually, English proficiency is extremely high here. And I think from a service industry perspective, it actually holds quite a lot of uh, potential. Climate is important. Um, and again, when we have modern office buildings that are ESG friendly, that are, that are modern, that are green, you know, this is so important, whether it's green roofs or whether it's just green space to absorb water, to reduce um, urban heating, urban heat traps. Um, Cambodia is going to be one of the most challenged countries on the planet when it comes to climate change. So the reality is that we need to be future proofing our real estate because the reality is that we, we have to look after ourselves as a market and making green environmentally friendly buildings is is for sure one of the best ways uh, to do that. Finally, uh, the last uh, trend to keep an eye on is, is the demographics and uh, development, which is just an incredible trend which is unfolding, whether it's infrastructure development, whether it's urbanization, whether it's just the continued rising quality of education. You know, th These are going to be incredibly important for uh, the future of work and uh, the overall evolution of Cambodia's real estate space. So without further ado, I will uh, move on to uh, the panel discussion. So I, I hope everybody uh, enjoyed uh, this presentation and uh, I look forward to an engaging conversation with uh, my panelists. So if you just give us a moment, we will set up the chairs, I hope, and uh, we will move on to the <laughs> panel discussion. Thank you very much. 
it seems like it's very important. I would have thought price would be the, 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 the key factor. So we've hit 32 votes. <laughs> price location ESG, my assumption. Okay, so uh, environmental and sustainability items are extremely important, it seems, for, for people in the audience, which I'm very uh, happy uh, to see. That's good. Okay, uh, next question, please, you too. So uh, the, the final question is, what are the three most important amenities for your ideal office? So this one is a little bit uh, different. Uh, please send in uh, what you think the amenities are that are important. Is it, is it parking? Is it, uh, is it um, ESG uh, standards? Is it uh, F&B? Is it having a restaurant within the building or close by? Let us know. Fun and fully equipped. Didn't expect that one. Okay, parking in Greenway, number one. This one's taking longer than previous ones. Okay, so parking and greenery are number one, kind of in conflict there. I think. Uh, hopefully, it's not uh, just just parking on the on the field. Hopefully, it's uh, parking above ground or underground for an efficient use of space. So, um, without further ado, I think we'll go on to the the panel uh, discussion to keep things moving and, and interesting. So, uh, if we can go back to the uh, other screen, please. So uh, while that is going on in the background, I, I will ask the panelists uh, the first and probably the most important question of the evening. Um, okay, so um, what, what is an office of the 21st century? And I'll ask uh, Mr. Tebong Chai first. Um, I think office is uh, all about productivity. So it will always be that way. So you move from the factory to the region space to the office. It's still all about productivity. So but what changes is what is productivity and it changes with the type of well and then for a little while and now the oncoming uh, change in technology and how AI will impact how the world really work and therefore what we use in our productivity. Thank you for that uh, great answer. Uh, T, can you uh, give us the other, uh, your, your, your same question? Uh, yeah. Hopefully sure. different answer. Thanks for the question. Um, it's, it's not really surprising that we're going to do something. We're going to use uh, Rome as an example as uh, being an uh, office of the 21st century. Uh, the reason being is that uh, I think the office of the 21st century uh, should be a place that uh, uh, can uh, uh, serve as a business ecosystem, uh, meaning that there are uh, many places, facilities, amenities that are uh, conducive to uh, uh, you know doing business so to speak not not too different to what uh, what China has mentioned previously but uh, also I think it will be uh, given that we are in Pompeii in, in most Asian countries it will be more of a community that where uh, not just that there is office space but there are uh, a residential area um, a hotel uh, so it would be more likely to be mixed use so I think this is very key and the reason being is that uh, city like Pumping, Bangkok is getting more crowded and crowded. So part of the solution to the problem that offices uh, need to solve and development to solve is you know, how to uh, get there quickly, how to do things quickly and more efficient. So uh, that's my sort of insight to, in terms of what an office like for 21st century is still. Yeah. And of course, uh, ESG and the leads and all those things that uh, we've discussed uh, just previously. First of all, thank you for all the time. I guess I will answer you as a designer, as an architect. Um, I happen to design a few buildings that's not in your case studies. Uh, I, think, uh, I think when, when we design uh, offices, it's like we designing a relationship. So, relationship between people to people, relationship between people to their space, 
to their organization or to their environments. So when, when we design Oxfam, for example, we, we're not trying to design the most, uh, the coolest office, but we're trying to understand what Oxfam stands for. What is the Oxfam identity? We try to have the emotional attachment of, of the staff that go to work to the organization and the space that they share uh, in comparison to their private desk. So the balance between B space and B space is very important for us when we try to design uh, Oxfam. Uh, and when we design office buildings, Oxfam is an interior design project. But when we design a uh, modern office, for example, we uh, put into the consideration of, into a lot of the environmental factors. Because it's a, it's a standalone building, so we have to think about an urban, uh, urban planning uh, point of view. How does people approach a building? And how does people that are already inside a building, when they, when they are already inside, how do they respond to the environment that they just came from? Uh, so the relationship between a building to an urban uh, street is very important. So by, by understanding that, uh, we were not trying to design a cool uh, glass building, but we just want to design a connection between a building to the street or a connection between people to the street. When, when we put this uh, uh, relationship into the design process, it allowed us to Think outside the box, for example. How can we open the core of the building? How can we bring natural light into the core? How can we improve uh, connection between people to people when they, when they come out from the elevator? Uh, is there any uh, community space? Uh, is there, can they have a view of the greenery? Can they have a view of the street uh, that they just came from? Uh, so that, by doing that, it sort of allowed us to creatively turn and tweak or rotate a building a certain way so it become the identity or the image or the facade of uh, modern office. Um, so to me, uh, a modern office, uh, office of the 21st century, should design for people in mind, design for community in mind, and design for uh, the environmental in mind. So. I, I would say that's quote of the evening. You know, designing an office is designing a relationship. Uh, that really uh, was a, uh, you know, that really struck me. So uh, thank you for such a, a thoughtful answer. Uh, we have a, a few more questions from this side. Uh, we'll probably give it uh, around two questions uh, that we have uh, for uh, the panelists from the CBRE perspective, and then we'll open up uh, questions in, in the audience if anybody's got any questions for this esteemed uh, set of panelists. So um, for, for Vong Chai, um, can you give us some perspective from a developer's standpoint on uh, what you have done to sort of optimize uh, the experience of, of a tenant? Well, um, for TK Central, we were, we were lucky because we were developing a mixed use building. And one of the main reasons why we wanted to develop that is because we wanted a project that has a 24 hours uh, operating cycle. So, your know, core services could be running 24 hours. So there's no um, waste and body carbon, so to speak. Um, but the, the, uh, the fortunate thing about that is that we have all this flexibility to increase and ease as we want. We have a gym on site, great parking, and uh, a central garden connecting all these retail, residential, and office spaces. And all these is true rigorous understanding of how the local market, or I guess how people behave. And I guess it's true that we look sort of designing relationships and how people behave when once they get to the office and what they want to do after uh, doing for their lunch and after work, where they want to go, they want to go for a drink, go to the gym, and how will they park, how will they move from home uh, to the office and back home. 
So uh, I guess uh, to sum it up, we these amenities is all, and what these amenities are very important to the experience of the tenant and the users. But what is important is what is the is aspiration and the other. So certain aspiration we had at the start of the project had to be uh, changed in order to keep up with the feedback that we had from the tenants. So I think that's very important as well to keep a very open communication with tenants in order to constantly change the way we operate and adapt according to the requirement. Brilliant, thank you for that uh, perspective. Uh, T, would you like to add on to, to, to that? Or? Uh, sorry, what was the question again? I saw you grab a microphone. Yeah. I, I, I sense some excitement there. So yeah. maybe, maybe I'll just ask a, a similar question with a, with a slightly different uh, angle. How can real estate developers create spaces that meet the need of modern workers? I think I'm going to repeat what the two gentlemen said. I mean, I'm not going to go through myself. Yeah, tell me about it. Uh, but a, a lot of these things uh, has to do with, uh, in, from our perspective, uh, there's two uh, driving principles. Um, one is uh, human centric. Uh, everything is designed uh, for the end user, uh, whether it's the, the owner, uh, the worker, uh, the, the, the maintenance crew, the property management crew. Um, so, from the owner perspective, uh, is the uh, property uh, really designed? Uh, linked to low maintenance and low operation costs. Uh, for the worker, uh, will it be a fun place to work? Uh, 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 places where uh, they, they, they are happy and healthy, right? And for the uh, maintenance crew, uh, people who are, uh, you know, look after the building, the staff of the building, um, uh, is it easy to, 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 to operate? Uh, is it, uh, uh, will it provide a, a seamless experience to the, the people who come to visit the building as well? So for us, uh, this is one key measure. Uh, the other part is that um, you know when we are thinking about uh, developing and, and, and creating a space, we want to know uh, how can we serve the space in terms of uh, how can we complement the space, and also how can we uh, leverage off the surrounding space as well. So for us, we call it the uh, walkable, uh, integrated city, so that. Whatever we do, we want to make sure that the people who occupy and live, work, uh, 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 and the staff uh, in our development are uh, able to access all the amenities nearby very quickly. So I think this is very important for what we have to do. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, would you like to add on to that at all? Or? Absolutely, absolutely. It's, an, it's another really interesting angle. So we'd, you know, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, I, I, I think tenant mix is important, right? Uh, you want to design an office where line-minded people want to go. Uh, you want to design an office where uh, people will enjoy similar things. Uh, so I think for, for developer, uh, like Adam and Chai, I think uh, you, will, you will think a lot about tenant mix. Uh, being being mixed is important. Um, having retail, having uh, well-being attached uh, to, the, to the space or to the building is important. Um, yeah, and I, I and I think the first the twenty first century uh, workforce is very environmentally conscious. So whatever uh, you develop, you have to consider the environment, right? Environmentally friendly, and I see that you do a lot at the bottom. Um, Vertical garden, I mean, it's, uh, your, the building is not belong to you alone, it belongs to your neighbor, it belongs to people in the city. So, uh, the responsibility of a developer when you design a building, when you build a building, it has to provide benefit to, you know, to people around you. So, when, uh, so that can be the responsible way of, of developing uh, a, a business. Well. Brilliant, thank you. So I, I think we will uh, open up uh, this uh, panel discussion to the audience. So does anybody have a question? Uh, please put your hand up if you do, and uh, we'll get the microphone sent over to you. So uh, don't be shy. <laughs> anybody at all? 
Let me have a look. Uh, just, I'm a bit short, so I thought I should stand up. Oh, we've got one, one at the back. Uh, okay, thank you for your presentation and uh, the meaningful discussion. So uh, my name is uh, Polak from uh, Atelier Cambodia. I'm an energy engineering. So I had uh, an interesting discussion about uh, the design. And uh, my question is about uh <coughs> the energy efficiency for the building. So I would like you to uh, share your idea about the energy efficiency aspects. B because in order to uh <laughs> design a fr environmental friendly uh, building, we have to consider about energy efficiency because it, it, I, as I believe in my mind that it would have saved for the operation in the future yes and benefit to the carbon footprint as well thank you I, I've just got one quick thing to say before I, I pass the microphone over to the, uh, to the other panelists but I, I think particularly now when um, the world and the economy is, is so challenging if, if you're trying to sell ESG to somebody, you focus on the cost saving, you know? Uh, while real estate is extremely challenging, while we see the top line numbers falling in many respects, and we see construction costs going up, I think a massive selling point will be uh, on, the, on the cost saving things, and you know, that's gonna help your, your margin at, at the bottom line. So I think if you're looking for a selfish way of selling selflessness, um, it's, it's cost saving in, in, in many respects and, and I think most developers would, would buy that. So I, I think um, if we're trying to convince people to, to get on board with these principles and ideas, um, cost saving is a really good and interesting way of starting. Um, I, I'm a practical guy, you know, and I, and I think that's a, a really important way of, of, of approaching it. Um, anyone else want to add, add on to that? I think from uh, the energy efficiency uh, perspective, um, especially in uh, Cambodia, I think we all know that our electricity cost is uh, some of the highest in the, the region. Uh, so this is a, a huge selling point. So it's not just something that is nice to do or is in fashion to do, uh, but something that's very practical and um, um, for, the, for, for, for the operator, for the business owner, um, this is very important for the life of the building and for the, the life of the business. Uh, I think there's a study, you know, a, a, across the world, a, a LEED or a green certified building uses 30% less energy. That's across uh, worldwide. But I think in Cambodia, I think the cost saving will be much, much more. So I think this is really a, an important consideration for, for, for Cambodia. Yep. Okay, what can I add on? Uh, well, when, when, when you uh, design, as an architect, when, when I design a building, uh, so there's two ways to cool the building, right, in, in, in hot climate like Cambodia. So you, you use active system like air conditioning or you use electricity like uh, 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 lighting, right? Or you can use passive system, right? When you use passive system, you use natural light as much as possible and you use natural wind as much as possible. Uh, like I mentioned at uh, Marlin office, for example, we open the co-op. So when you open the co-op, it's not just creating a relationship between people to the street or people to people. It's also bring in natural light and it's also bring in natural ventilation so that that's like Lauren say, there's this uh, common area that you don't have to spend money on, right? So you save on uh, electricity costs at the end. Uh, but of course, uh, it, it cannot apply to, you know, 30, 50 story building. It might work for Malin because it's only 11th floor and below. Uh, so that also have to put into consideration. And it's also building orientation is very important. So when you design, you have to know your climate, you have to know your microclimate, you have to know your solar orientation. How do you design your building so that uh, you can provide sh enough shading to the in interior spaces so that when your tenant move in, they don't have to 
uh, you know, uh, turn on 100% uh, uh, air conditioning or, the, or turn on uh, uh, full lighting, for example. Yeah. Thank you. So as um, developers, head of sales, architect, um, you know, when you guys go around our beautiful city and drive around or go to meetings, what is the one feature or function uh, of any office, and feel free to be specific, uh, that you find really appalling or just um, something that really gets to you, you know? And like what, what is that one thing that you're like, I, I wish people would stop you? You mean driving? Driving to places? Driving in the city? Walking? Uh, I think traffic, right? Uh, the time taken from one place to the, to the next uh, would be uh, the most uh, annoying uh, daily ritual that one has to go through. Uh, can, can you think of anything else? Uh, Maybe parking, uh, maybe traffic, yeah. Yeah, parking for sure. And uh, for me, it's uh, uh, ventilation and, and being able to uh, get to the floor very quickly. Uh, some of the uh, older building is very antiquated. Um, so, you know, getting from one floor to another takes a bit of time. Uh, you know, as we get busier, we become more impatient. And I think, you know, the, the office of the 21st century goes uh, uh, some ways to readdress this uh, the issue of time and impatience. So yeah, through integration of AI and so on. Yeah. My mine is, is a double edged sword. Uh, on one hand, I yeah parking again appalling. Uh, some some of these spaces you can't even move the car properly without touching another car. Uh, but on the other hand, I th what I find um, in as appalling is not being able to approach the building on foot. And I think it has to do with urban planning or uh, just the way that cities developed over uh, the past state decades. And what's missing as well, because it, it, it's a pity because most of these buildings are designed to be approached on foot. If you look at, you know, even Rosewood or Satapana or some of these Merlin, in the future, once it's done, it, the approach from foot is so much better uh, in the way that you view and enter the building as compared to being dropped off at the back of the house where the car park is, and you're not experiencing the entrance that you're supposed to, well, unless you have a driver. But yeah, I, I guess for me, that's those two. Um, I think it's important for me to caveat that I'm a guest, <laughs> a very fortunate guest in, the, in this city. So. Um, I think it's important that I, I highlight that to, just to begin with, but I, I think for me it, it comes down to urban planning just as much as anything, and as, as many of my, my colleagues will know, I'm slightly obsessed with urban planning and its um, implications and ramifications um, if it's not done in a, in a long-term uh, considered manner, and um, walkability is so important. Again, I, 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 was in, I was in Taiwan just two weeks ago, and uh, it was probably the most green uh, city I've probably ever been in in terms of walkability. There were there were cereal codes on plastic bags. I got told to leave a cafe because I ordered a, a takeaway coffee, uh, not uh, sorry, basically couldn't sit inside. And I love that. I think it was so respectful for, for this cafe to throw me out because I because I ordered a coffee and a takeaway cup. So these things are, are really important. And one last thing is 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 trees and. Um, and old architecture or buildings uh, because they're so important for the identity and, and urban fabric of, of, of the city. So those are, those are a few things that um, I'd love to see more of, particularly trees because they, they, they complement a city so much. So um, one, uh, or let's do two more questions if anyone's got energy and then uh, we will uh, have, a, have a beer and, and relax. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I think if we are fortunate today to have diverse speakers from uh, multiple industries. So, as we know, the mo modern office buildings are an important landscape for every capital city. So, uh, what type of buildings will best represent Cambodian emblem or a landmark building? You know, because like uh, in the 20th century, we have the Petronas Twin Tower, 
So that was like uh, representing the icon and the ambition of the Malaysian government to be uh, a nation icon. And, and you know, good conceptual building inspire people, people to come to work early and be more productive. productive. Should, Should the government, government regulate the design or impose some kind of uh, in terms of the green, green initiative, or left it for the developers to comply or voluntary? Voluntary, voluntary or should, should the government impose a certain guidelines so that we can, can speed up the uh, green concept? I will, I will give my two cents, and then uh, I think this is quite an interesting question, so I'll let everyone else uh, answer. But firstly, I think we're actually in a pretty iconic building, uh, and I think. Um, Batnak Tower has been an icon of the uh, Phnom Penh uh, skyline for the past decade. Um, absolutely, there should be planning codes and regulations around design, whether it's height, whether it's site coverage, FAR, population allowance. These things are very, very important and, and, and create uh, livable uh, cities. Um, design is also really important, as I mentioned, around identity of a city. Um, the reality is that people go to beautiful cities on holiday because, just because they're beautiful, right? Like people go to Venice, people go to Paris, primarily because they're beautiful. So beauty is really important, not only from um, just a, a livability perspective, but even from an economic perspective. So on so many levels, it's, it's, it's absolutely vital. Um, yeah, government intervention is uh, needed, I think, in especially for inspections. Uh, I think the beauty of uh, some cities is that you allow it to grow organically. And while you have regulation, you shouldn't limit too much on what the developers or designers can do. Uh, one interesting uh, s story that I had was in Singapore back in the 60s, uh, the government brought in uh, these architects to uh, build this uh, office zone, uh, and they did the classic 60s architecture style, which is grids, like New York, and uh, they were gonna demolish all these uh, shop houses uh, that were, have been there for hundreds of years. So there was an intervention from a group of local architects, which then stopped this uh, master plan from proceeding, and then they saved that area. You know those areas now as uh, Clucky and Bokey, right? But so th these are when, 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 when government intervention might have an overreach. But then if the same case in Singapore, if there's, there was no government intervention, you wouldn't have Marina Bay Sands. And, and I would it, arguably it's a landmark. So I think it's a balance of both. But what government intervention should provide is safety in any uh, built environment there is. And I think that is key. And I think that is, um, that's regulation to keep everyone safe. But you, yeah, I, I think you should let architects and the de developer go a little bit wild. Keep the occupants safe. Yeah. I guess it's both the occupants and the workers. Um, just going back to the question, um, I think in an emerging market and a developing market like Cambodia, uh, government intervention and setting guidelines and enforcing compliance, I think this is necessary uh, because uh, our market and our industry still lacks maturity. So it lacks any sense of direction. So I think this is very key for Phnom Penh in Cambodia. Uh, on the second point, uh, I guess that question really, it's almost written for Odong uh, in terms of uh, uh, what building represent Cambodia. Uh, on a world stage. Uh, the reason I, I choose Odom and not saying Odom because I'm here and, and so on, because the whole concept of Odom was inspired by a Cambodian story. Uh, the tower itself is, is inspired by Uncle Wat in terms of uh, its material, in terms of its facade. Um, but I often share with people, it's, uh, it's uh, the whole project of Odom, it's, it's the story of our past and the story of our future. And I'll quickly explain to you why it's the story of our past. Um, you know, Cambodia, we all know that, you know, once upon a time, uh, we were the best engineer, we were the best architect, and so on. And it's a reflection of that. Why is it the story of our future, for Dom? Uh, it represents uh, the Cambodian people, it, its aspiration, 
right? It is wanting to show the world that, hey, look at us, we can do this. So this is why I think uh, Odong uh, certainly, uh, from a cultural aspect, uh, represent uh, this yeah, as an iconic building. Thank you. Trying to be short, <laughs> I guess uh, it's ironic because you your slides are already using a lot of backdrop from Singapore, um, and we're talking about Singapore a lot. Um, well, in term of in term of landmark, I don't think I don't think we plan our city thinking about landmark um, uh, in 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 ambition. But I think we should plan our city uh, to have good buildings. Once you have good building, you establish a relationship between your population, the urban population, and, and the building, right? So good building probably has to do with uh, uh, the symbiosis between human and nature, right? So you have the physical building, and then you have people, and then you have nature. So these, these three components can establish a good building and then when when your population love that building and then it will become landmark. So you probably don't have that landmark from the beginning but it might end up uh, later on, right? Uh, in terms of rec government regulation, yes, there has to be uh, 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 a planning to becoming the garden city or to becoming the forest yeah, in the future. Yeah. So, yeah. That would be a good topic. Sort of government regulation and uh, how you can help support the current uh, residential market. Excuse me? Uh, that would be, that a, would be a, great a great topic. topic. Can you uh, elaborate, elaborate a little bit, little bit more about, about uh, the current market, market situation, situation and how uh, developers, developers can, can help, help to, uh, I, I guess I would say, create new incentives for people, especially local Khmer, to purchase properties. I think what we'll do is uh, just to let everybody uh, rest assured, we'll do 30 seconds each uh, per panelist on this one, and then we will uh, call, call it a day. So um, in terms of uh, what the government can do, wow, okay, well, planning regulations first and foremost. Um, I think uh, supply is going to be challenging uh, over the next sort of, let's say, a few years to some extent, uh, depending on uh, the, the project. So um, controlling the supply is going to be critical and, and controlling the quality in many respects. And, and if, you, if you were here for earlier on, you will have noticed that when I spoke about offices that... I mentioned that none of them were built equally. Some of them outperformed because of the quality, because of the location, and the reality is that, that having the right rules and regulations generally will filter uh, the market to go in the right direction. So uh, that is my, my primary uh, focus to encourage uh, long-term sustainable development. Um, I think for me, government should, uh, well, our government encourage free markets which I think we all enjoy. But that, uh, that being said, they should control it with the right regulation to make, again, safe buildings. And I think um, if we have that, the rest is a free market. I think to keep it short, um, if we look at you know, what drives uh, domestic property growth and property sales, uh, in many countries, it's always driven by or supported by uh, the availability to credit and also affordable housing. I think uh, some of the challenges that we face now uh, is to access to credit and affordable credit. So if this change, if this improves, I think it goes some way in terms of driving sales. Well, I, I, I think... Uh I hate to say it takes time, but I think it will it will take time uh, for for incentive from our government. Uh, but I'm sure there uh, once we have certification uh, coming in the future, certification like LEED, uh, 
we can lead with established because of uh, uh, it's not just for developer and for the environment it's us also have the government incentive that encourage uh, the understanding of uh, environmental sustainability designs uh, and also envir environmental design so this uh, uh, this certification will happen in the future and to encourage that, I think government has to provide incentive, right? And in terms of lo localization, I think uh, in the future, once our population uh, grow, maybe uh, more population, there will be more demands in the future. I think uh, probably Cambodian population will get older also in the future, and then there will be uh, new, uh, new regulation, new uh, uh, incentive for government that provide accessible housing, for example, to, to elderly people or to, uh, you know, people of certain income, for example, but I think it will happen in the future, and I hate to say it takes time, so, yeah. So, uh, just to call uh, things uh, to a close, um, thank you very much to the panelists, uh, Mr. Chen San, Mr. T and Mr. Wong Chai. Um, it was a wonderful evening and I uh, really appreciate your participation. And uh, thank you very much to the crowd for your engagement and interesting questions. Have a lovely evening and uh, enjoy the refreshments. So uh, talk to you all later. Thank you. <laughs>